All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our fifth edition BCBA task list series. Today, we're continuing H selecting and implementing interventions with H6, monitor client progress and treatment integrity. A lot of what we do now is based on what we've already learned in our task list. So when we're monitoring client progress, it's going to be based on data collection and graphing and visual analysis and treatment integrity is going to be good supervision good ongoing training. As always, we're going to break these ideas down simply and what we think you need to know for your exam. Be sure to subscribe for all of our updates. We would really appreciate it. We have our sixth edition content coming soon. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard, spread the word. Let's get going. So client progress, how do we measure client progress? Well, we're going to measure it through data collection, graphing, and visual analysis. And the important piece is this should be continuous. So any sort of treatment integrity, any sort of client progress has to be continuously measured, meaning once a month is not enough to determine treatment integrity and client progress. This has to be ongoing. Your treatment plans need to be organic. They need to be adaptable to the changing needs of your client. Your client's needs are gonna change constantly, whether through growth or maturity or an ongoing learning, whatever it might be, those needs are going to change all the time and your treatment plans need to reflect those changing needs. So one, is your treatment effective? Effectiveness is determined by meaningful change, meaning just because you went from one to two doesn't mean it's meaningful. And meaningful is going to be individualized. So effectiveness, progress, it's all based on one client and their needs versus another client and their needs. Everything is individualized because we work with a bunch of different populations, with a bunch of different needs, and a bunch of different challenges. So for what is acceptable for one client may mean no progress for another. And that's going to be all based on your assessment and your knowledge of that particular client. So again, client progress is measured through data collection, graph data, and visual analysis. Data collection is not enough. You have to graph that data and you have to visually analyze that graph data to get a full picture of progress or no progress. So why do we monitor client progress? Well, one, early detection of problems or issues. Too many times people will let things run for three weeks to a month and there was an issue in the second day and that's just too long. You're doing a disservice to your client. You have to catch these things early and be willing to change quickly. So you can't just get attached to something you designed. You have to be willing to change quickly. Data always drives our decisions. You can't go off of self-reports. So as much as you trust your technicians, you have to go off data. You have to go off what is actually happening at that session and with progress. Accountability. You want to be accountable to stakeholders. You want to be transparent. You want to show them data, show them graphs. You, you, this is how you build rapport. It's how you build trust. It's how you get them to buy into your system. You have to be make sure they're accountable and trans. You're accountable and transparent when you are dealing with these stakeholders and data collection and monitoring is a great way to do that. And then you're going to maximize client outcomes. You can't maximize client outcomes unless you're monitoring progress. You can't set it and forget it no matter how well you think the client is doing or how well you think that treatment plan is. Things can change very, very quickly. And you as the analyst, it is your job to be ready and aware of when that might happen. Now, treatment integrity, also known as procedural fidelity. So this is a key point. These are the same things. Fidelity, integrity, same thing. So when you see that on the exam, they're interchangeable. Integrity and fidelity, same thing. It's the extent to what your intervention is implemented as designed, meaning you write it in a certain way. You write your behavior plan a certain way. If it's implemented as written, there is high fidelity. But as we know, things happen, observer drift, bias, right? Treatment drift, all these things can happen to affect that fidelity. And it's your job to maintain that integrity always, right? It's critical in applied behavior analysis. 
poor treatment integrity was going to bring into question the validity, reliability, and accuracy of data. Because if your fidelity lacks, let's say, validity, well, your staff might be measuring the wrong thing. If it's not reliable, then you can't expect the same thing or the same results over and over again. And if it's inaccurate, then that's the worst, right? Because your data is just straight up wrong. So integrity is going to affect all these aspects of good data. It can also lead to new and unwanted behavior problems if we're inadvertently reinforcing the wrong thing. Let's say we're using punitive punishment when we shouldn't, or let's say extinction is not being implemented with 100% consistency. All these things can lead to new problems for you. So you might think it's more work to monitor integrity, when in reality, it's going to be more work for you if fidelity is poor and new behaviors are occurring because of that poor fidelity. It's also unethical to provide treatments with poor integrity because you are failing to do your job. Your treatments are written with ethics in mind. And when integrity is lost, then some of that ethical base, some of that ethical foundation is lost as well. So it's not only about your treatment, but it's also about remaining ethical in service delivery. So how do we monitor treatment integrity? Well, you can use checklists, protocols, session notes are all good ways to indirectly measure integrity. You should always be reading your staff's session notes, making sure everything is consistent, but no integrity monitoring, no client progress monitoring is complete without direct observations and supervision. This is your primary job. Training, development, supervision, this is what you do other than design treatments. You're now a manager. You're now a boss. You're now a trainer. And it is your responsibility to make sure your staff is trained well and they receive ongoing supervision, not once a month, but as often as you possibly can. Super important. And then performance reviews and constructive feedback. When you're doing that supervision, you want to give feedback that is constructive, that is building on the positives and trying to eliminate some of the negatives. So finally, let's quickly talk about inter-observer agreement. This is when two or more observers measure the same thing, and then you compare measurements. IOA is very, very important. When you do your supervision, you should be doing IOA checks, meaning you should be taking data and comparing your data to your staff's stuff. It's the best way to figure out, are we agreeing on what we're measuring? on the data we're taking, is the data good? IOA, extremely important. Here's a few different ways to take inter-observer agreement, and we'll just go through these pretty quickly, but we can start with total count IOA, it's the simplest. You just take the small count of data, divided by the large count, and you multiply it by 100. So for instance, observer one, so three instances of behavior, observer two, five, you divide that, you get 60% IOA, which is not great, right? It means you only agreed 60% of the time. You have mean count per interval IOA. So you're breaking up the observations into intervals, as you see here. Then you calculate total count IOA for each interval. So first interval is 75%, then 50%, 100%. So overall IOA, 75%. Better, but still not great. And then exact count, per interval IOA is the most strict. Again, you've got your intervals and you are looking for, did you agree fully? So for instance, interval one, there was no agreement. Interval three, there was no agreement. Only in interval two was there agreement. That's going to come up to 33% IOA, which is very, very low. And then finally, trial by trial IOA. Again, you have your intervals and you're looking at did you observe the same occurrence or non-occurrence? Either you recorded a response or you didn't. Did it happen? Did it not? In this case, interval one, there was no response. You agreed. Interval three, there was a response. You agreed. Interval two, did not agree. So your IOA is 67%. All four of these are ways you can take IOA. In these examples, IOA is not very good. You would expect it to be higher. You want it to be higher. But if you get an IOA of 60%, that is a great way to immediately see that something needs to be corrected because you are not agreeing 
with what your staff are seeing. So IOA is a very, very, very quick way to check for that integrity. All right, so that was H6. Might have felt like a lot, but you just have to keep it simple. And if you just keep in mind, your job as the analyst is to design that treatment and then to, to monitor that treatment. Is your client making progress? Are you being effective? Is it meaningful progress? And then what about the integrity? Is the data, are the data accurate, valid, and reliable? Do you agree with what your technicians are seeing? As always, thanks for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass your exam, let us know. Work hard, study hard, spread the word. We'll see you soon.